Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome to our webinar today. We are so beyond excited to have Dr. Savannah Landis here. She is my buddy now. It's official. <laughs> so we're going to be chatting for the next 30 minutes about embracing imperfection, achieving excellence, which is really a really interesting conversation about how to navigate athletic sport related goals while walking the fine line of getting into that perfectionistic compulsive space with it. So whether that's you, whether that's someone that you love that you're looking to support, whether that's just understanding what goes into that excellence when it comes to sport and movement. We're so excited to have you here today. Um, and I think my only quick housekeeping announcement is that this um, meeting will be recorded. We are going to cut the recording. It'll still say it's recording, but I'm going to edit out the recording when it gets to the Q&A portion at the end. So don't be afraid to come off mute and ask questions if they come up. Um, and we also want to do a special shout out um, on the Clarity side. We're doing our October Fall for Classes game um, this month. So everyone who takes every single instructor's class once and then comes Comes to an event like this or any of our Clarity events gets their November dues waived. So congrats to anyone who is dabbling in that, who is on the call, and congrats to anyone who achieves that goal by the time that this recording comes live. So <laughs> without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to Dr. Savannah Landis, and we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks so much for being here. Awesome. Yay. Thank you, Abby. Yeah, this, this is a really... Um exciting and fun. Well, I guess more like passionate topic of mine, just with my own background in sport. And then as a sports psychologist, so just so that everyone knows, I was trained as a generalist, but did a lot of my practicums in the um, area of eating disorders and sports psychology. And so perfectionism is strong in both of those realms. And then especially when those realms come together of like athletes dealing with disordered eating. Um, so I'm going to walk everyone through today a little bit more about how perfectionism can be used as a superpower, when to know when those high achieving mindsets are being more in a maladaptive place, how we can tap into adaptive perfectionism, and then the kind of relationship to sport, especially as it relates to disordered eating. Um, and like Abby said, if people have questions, happy to answer things throughout the presentation, and then also happy to do the Q&A at the end. Um, but I will go ahead and get us started. So to start, um, an overview of what we're doing today is again, kind of the perfectionism as superpower. We're going to go adaptive versus maladaptive perfectionism, um, the application to eating disorder in sport, consequences of eating disorder, or disordered eating in sport and fitness, and then ways to tap into that adaptive perfectionism. So I also wanted to give kind of like an overview of who this presentation is intended for, like who I kind of was picturing in my mind when I was making this presentation. So the first is high achievers or quote unquote perfectionists. And I want to say this lightly because I think a lot of us in society kind of think of high achievers or perfectionists as like this person who has it all together and they're like perfect and successful at work and at their home life and in their nutrition and who they are as a partner or as a mom or just kind of like that idea of almost like what you see in the movies as a perfectionist. And that's not really what the research defines a perfectionist as. There's actually a lot of different type of perfectionists. Um, and people who are high achieving even can just have one area of their life that they consider themselves a high achiever or a perfectionist in. Um, so I think like the example of like a very successful CEO who runs a really successful company and is very motivated to kind of get that company to the, the highest they can go, but maybe has like a really messy and chaotic house. Like we don't need to be perfectionists in all aspects of life to consider ourselves a high achiever. Um, so I just wanted people to know like wherever you identify with things in this presentation are appropriate. And so like take what you leave and, or take what you need and leave the rest. Um, similarly, I made this for athletes and I can't remember where this quote exactly came from, but it was like, if you can move your body, then you're an athlete. So 
it just is different intensities and goals. So some people are training for, you know, to be a pro athlete and they're training day in and day out. There's high intensities involved. Um, they have these kind of big goals at the end of it, but then other people who, you know, are just hitting the gym, they have their own personal fitness goals or trying to progress in certain ways, or they just love movement. Um, again, I think it's more important for the person themselves to decide where they identify along that spectrum. Um, so I just wanted to say when I use the word athlete moving forward today, just know that I'm talking about all the movers out there. So whether you're a pro athlete or a performer or a gym goer or someone who just enjoys spending time moving their body, um, just wanted to give that heads up there. So let's get into the rest. Um, so perfectionism as a superpower. Perfectionism is a superpower. And I think I, a lot of the stuff from today's presentation comes a lot from um, The Perfectionist Guide to Losing Control by Kathleen Schaffler. It's a great book. I highly recommend anyone read it. And in her book, she talks a lot about um, how society and like, especially women identify as like being recovering perfectionists that like this ambition or this drive to succeed inside of us is something that we have to like recover from. And I like that new spin because really having that drive, that ambition, that desire to tap into that potential to achieve great things, that is all really amazing and really helps people be successful in their life. And not everyone has those same characteristics. Certainly people have strengths in their own ways across the board, but when we have these as perfectionists, it's it's great and it ought to actually be celebrated rather than kind of feeling like this is something I have to heal or move on from. Um, I'll get into that more when it kind of comes from the adaptive or maladaptive side of things, um, but just wanted to say like this can be a superpower and we're going to talk about how. One person that comes to my mind when I think of adaptive perfectionism is Ted Lasso from the Ted Lasso show on Apple TV. If anyone's watched it, it's great. You know, someone who is a sport coach, has high goals for his team, but treated everyone like a human, took their athlete identity and their sport identity and cared for the whole being, didn't pursue perfectionism by hurting himself or others, but really someone who believed in something great and did so in a helpful and enjoyable way. Um, so not abandoning goals, but also not abandoning himself or the people around him in a hurtful way to get those goals, if that all makes sense. Um, and some of these quotes here are from that perfectionist guide to losing control. Um, and the first one that I wanted to share is that perfection is a paradox. So the first part of that quote is you can never become perfect, which, you know, we kind of think of that of like, you know, I, there is no such thing as perfection. We can kind of think like only robots can be perfectionistic. And even then, like if anyone's had to do a software update on their phone, because it's not working, like even our robots can't be perfect. And especially us as humans, there's no such thing as perfect. Um, so we can never become perfect. And I think a lot of us can wrap our minds around that idea. And then the latter half is, and you already are perfect. And this is that like, we are born with a wholeness that we don't earn. And I often talk to my clients about this in terms of like, think of babies, like when babies are born into this world, they are adorable, but they also cry, scream, poop, eat and sleep. And that's kind of the only things that they do. They're not winning gold medals or, you know, making a bunch of money or using their outcomes as a way to define their worth. And neither are we. We're just like so grateful that they're here and we love them with all their hearts. So somewhere along the way in our adult lives or even like in our teenage lives, we start to base our wholeness off of and our worth off of our outcomes rather than something that we innately have. Um, so people in an adaptive perfectionistic mindset believe that both of these statements can be true, that you can never become perfect and you already are. Maladaptive mindset folks believe both parts are both parts of this quote are false. So that perfectionism absolutely is possible and that I am not perfect as I am. The last piece there too is um, ideals in our society are meant to inspire, not necessarily to achieve. Um, and I think a lot of times people in perfectionist mindset say, there's the ideal, here's where I'm at. I got to close the gap between that ideal and myself, and I'm going to do anything and everything I can to get there. 
So there's this compulsive striving to try to bridge that gap. And more often than not, the ideal isn't really meant to be achieved. We can't really achieve it. Um, we might get really close. Um, and even if we do achieve it, we feel like unfulfilled. We feel like we're still not good enough. And so there's really this unfulfilling kind of uh, exhausting process that goes on. So really the, the antidote to this is values. What do you want your life to stand for regardless of the outcome? Thinking of values of this place of, I care about living my life in an honest way, or I value being a hard worker, even if that means that I don't get the promotion or I don't run a PR. I still value the process of showing up each day and giving what I have to that moment. All right, so let's get into a little bit more of the mindset, a difference between adaptive versus maladaptive. And we're going to break these down into different parts. So overall, the dysfunction in perfectionism, the dysfunction is in the approach, not the person. So if you're sitting here or watching this presentation and you're like, well, I just am too, I'm too crazy or I'm too um, perseverative on this type of thing. Like there's no way I could change into a mal or into an adaptive mindset. That's not true. Like Everybody has the ability to do this. The dysfunction is in the approach to how I pursue excellence, not in whether I'm capable of it or not. Um, also to note that all perfectionists have an inner critic. It's pretty, and I would say also say probably most people have an inner critic as well, but people in an adaptive mindset can respond to that inner critic with self-compassion and self-compassion in a way that doesn't let anybody off the hook or anything like that, but just in a way that says like, I hear you, I see you, and we have goals, how can we get there? Their sense of self-worth is stable and they're operating from a mindset of abundance versus in the maladaptive place, there's this deficit mindset. I'm really driven by insecurity to fix what's broken in me or to compensate for what's missing. There's kind of this state of living in waiting. I'll be worthy when, I'll be worthy when I get the promotion. I'll be worthy when I lose 10 pounds. I'll be happy when da, 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 da. And again, I think most people, if anyone's been on their own personal journey or have seen other people in this, I see it a lot with my clients, even when they're like, I'll be worthy when I get the promotion and they get it, not satisfied, not satisfied. And so it's like, what's the point then really, if we're going to kind of suffer along the way to this goal, because there's something else in the maladaptive mindset. There's this true insecurity that like, I'm broken, I'm not good enough. And that's what deserves more attention moving forward. Um, but we're going to break these down. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first part of that chart was compulsive versus responsive. So maladaptive perfectionists live in a compulsive reaction state. So they'd notice, hmm, there's something that I could be better at. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I compulsively react. I'm not really thinking about it. I'm not being very mindful. And I'm kind of just lining up all the things that I have to do to make it better. People in an adaptive mindset take the time to pause, to reflect, to note what's going on, to note what they have that they're working with, and then responding in an intentional and mindful way. And I put up there the text that I don't know, probably I've definitely gotten, probably other people have gotten too, but this text gives me a lot of anxiety. <laughs> we need to talk. So a compulsive reaction would be, what about, when, is everything okay? Da -da -da -da. When can you call me? And maybe calling that person 12 times in a row. I'm compulsively reacting to this one text when we really don't know all the details versus someone who was in an adaptive mindset might still feel that anxiety of like, whoa, that's a scary text but saying, this is really scary, or like, I'm feeling nervous about this text. Can you tell me what this is about? Or I'd love to chat. When's a good time? And then managing what's going on inside in a way to before they kind of get more information before they need to respond. So the difference between compulsive reaction versus response, because sometimes it's like, we need to talk about the birthday party this weekend. If I was compulsively reacting the way I was just explaining, you have worked yourself up and traumatized yourself for no good reason, right? Um, and anxiety has a really nice way of telling us or making us believe rather that we are 
like whatever might happen is going to be too scary and then we're not going to have the ability to handle it. But freaking out doesn't help us with any of those anyway. Um, but responsive means to these types of stimulus help us say, I can acknowledge the discomfort here. And I know that like, we're going to figure it out. I'm going to figure it out. It's going to be okay. Not always comfortable. I always like to say too, like there's a, there's a difference between acceptance and approval. Acceptance is like radically accepting, like my reality is what it is right now. I don't necessarily have to approve or like it. So also just kind of know I'm coming from those different um, lenses. The next is acceptance versus control. So this quote from, from uh, Catherine Schaffler in the Perfectionist Guide is, you don't achieve liberation through control, you achieve it through acceptance. And so I put a little cycle of control up there that when we see something that's off or we notice that there's room for improvement, people in a maladaptive mindset who are operating from a state of control criticize themselves. It really is that like shaking finger of like, you're not doing enough. You need to be better. You need to do this. You should be doing this really harsh inner critic. And then that leads us to being like, okay, well, I have to control this. I have to control that so that I can get X, Y, Z outcomes. And I put try because oftentimes I think there's an illusion that we have control over certain things when really we don't. We might to some degree, and then there's kind of a law of diminishing returns after that. Um, but I kind of think of this as like the white knuckling place of like, if I'm kind of being yelled at by the inner critic, I tense up, I white knuckle, and I try to control everything. I try to be doing everything all at once so it can be as perfect as possible. And then when I'm that tense, results tend not to be as productive as they would if you were maybe in a more relaxed state. So now I'm really tense and now I'm not getting the results that I want. So I'm getting more frustrated at myself and at the outcomes, which then increases more psychological distress. I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling depressed. I'm feeling moody all the time. My relationships are unstable. And then I'm going back to criticizing myself. Well, why, why am I so anxious? Why can't I just get this right? I should be able to do this. I don't have time to be sad. And then the cycle repeats. So the cycle of, cycle of control is really tense. And when you are fixated on control, you're really disconnected from your self-worth. So the antidote to that is the cycle of acceptance. So the first part would be noticing. Notice non-judgmentally what is going on in your internal and external experiences. If you're noticing like, wow, I am really a lot more sluggish today when I'm lifting these weights. Like usually I can go a little harder. I can put on a little bit more weight, um, but I can't, I can't do it today. Okay. Well, what's going on? Well, I didn't have a lot of sleep last night. I've been working pretty hard. You know, life, life's been stressful, but overall my body is where it's at. I'm still here. I'm noticing, I'm noticing non-judgmentally. I'm seeing just the facts of the situation. Then I'm reflecting on my values and I'm making workable adjustments. So what is my value? Why am I here lifting these weights anyway? Is it for health? Is it for strength? Is it for continued mobility as I age? What is it? Probably also by showing up in that consistency, you're, you're living your value. So that might give some reprieve of any anxiety already. But if there's some like, okay, well, I'm a little off the mark. What What's something that I could change that would be workable and workable means I'm not harming myself or somebody else. And so if I have a math test and, or if I'm struggling in math, a workable adjustment might be like, well, do I have time to consult with my math teacher once a week for an extra 30 minutes to kind of hone those little skills that I might be missing? If I have a B and I want an A, 30 minutes with per week with my teacher might get me there. That seems pretty workable considering I'm a full-time student and I play sports and I'm a family member, X, Y, Z. Not workable would be like, well, you know what? I'm just going to print extra math sheets. I'm going to do three hours of math extra a night and I'm going to meet with my math teacher every day and I'm going to watch YouTube videos about math so that I can get 100%. Not super workable when you have so many other things going on. 
Um, I so appreciate bringing in support people when it comes to making workful adjustments and getting their feedback. So whether it's a trusted coach or a trusted family member or friend, a romantic partner saying, hey, I'm struggling with these things. I'm thinking about making these adjustments. Like, what's your feedback there? Because the people who know and love you will be like, yes, that's a great idea. I think go ahead, give it a try. The people that are open to being honest with you are going to be like, uh, I love the enthusiasm. And like, I don't think that's really going to help. That's my going to make you more tired. So anyway, reflecting on your values, making any workable adjustments as they see fit. And then moving to accepting the process. So all of us probably have experienced something in their lives so far where process is not linear. We are having highs and lows, but it's kind of the consistency that matters. But when we're working off of a values-based mindset, the highs and lows matter a lot less because I know that I'm living in pursuit of this thing that makes my life meaningful. The outcomes are kind of here or there. Um, So accepting the process. And when we're able to accept the process, then we get these more feelings of alignment and a stronger sense of self and self-worth which then gives us that openness to be able to notice once again, non-judgmentally and repeat the cycle. The next is on that chart a little while ago was insecurity versus opportunity. This comes a lot from Dr. Dweck's um, growth versus fixed mindset. So growth mindsets, I'm capable of growth and development. A fixed mindset is my my capabilities are static. And you can kind of see the difference on that chart there that I borrowed from an internet source um, is, you know, I can, I believe that I have development or I believe that I'm static. The people who have a belief that they are able to grow, embrace challenges, they are resilient, um, they appreciate the effort that they put into things. They're open to feedback. Folks in the fixed mindset are really avoidant of challenges. They get defensive. Um, They see their effortless as kind of like, you know, effort is, if if I don't get the outcome, then my effort was kind of worthless. Um, Ignoring or avoiding any criticism or feedback and feeling threatened by others. So there's a really big fear mindset over in the fixed mindset zone, which is really about avoidance of failure and avoidance of shame. So a lot of times, kind of like we were going back to um, one of the earlier slides is folks in this place, they're, they're coming from a fear of not feeling good enough or feeling like they have to compensate for something that's defective. And so I am really trying to avoid the shame of feeling like I'm a lesser person. So I I empathize with people in the fixed mindset. I have certainly lived in the fixed mindset myself, and I know the pain that comes from that. And there's ways to kind of acknowledge where you're, you're at and kind of push you in that other direction towards a growth mindset. Perceiving failure. So folks in a maladaptive, perfectionistic mindset are going to see failure as a defect of the self. Um, adaptive folks are going to see failure as a learning and growth opportunity. So for example, if I'm working with a swimmer and the swimmer is like, they swam slower than their goal time at their championship meet. And their thought was, I suck. I'll never get this right. I suck. Not even that, like I feel sucky me, myself, I'm defective. I suck. And now because I know that I'm defective, my thought moving forward is that I'm never going to get this right. I'm never going to get this time. How could I? How could I if I suck? So already we're kind of in this just really small, limited mentality versus someone in the adaptive mindset would say, I'm disappointed that I swam slow or I'm angry or I'm sad or whatever. I'm acknowledging that this, (laughs) this feels bad when I don't live up to the goal that I have. And I wonder what I could have done differently, or I wonder what I could do differently moving forward. So this ability to say this, this is hard. This is a hard moment. And what can I learn from this for the next time? And this is also a great place to rope in supports and people who, whether it's coaches, fitness instructors, teammates, et cetera. Um, The biggest part for me here is that adaptive mindset is that the sense of self-worth remains intact. Whether I do well or I do poorly or I meet my goal or I don't meet my goal, that has nothing to do with my worthiness as a person. 
which is, I think is really important and kind of like the, the core of this entire conversation. The last piece that was on that um, maladaptive versus adaptive chart is psychological health. And I think by now we can kind of see that people who are living in that maladaptive mindset are struggling so much with fear and shame and anxiety and depression and just feeling lost and confused because their sense of self-worth is just getting whiplash from any type of outcome that is unfavorable versus people who are in the more adaptive mindset, they are shown to have higher self-regard, higher levels of work engagement, um, more psychological well-being, higher motivation. They're more optimistic about the future and they have low levels of perceived failure. They're also coming from like a sport lens, which we're going to kind of transition to sport and the eating disorder piece here in a little bit is increased ability to enter flow states. So that's being in the zone. So athletes who talk about, I just went out there and I did it. I didn't think too much. That's called being in the zone. So people in the adaptive mindset are able to tap into the zone more easily than the people who are in the maladaptive mindset. So how do we tap into adaptive perfectionism? One is remind yourself that you are worthy as you are. You were born worthy and you will maintain your worth until the day you die. Checking in with yourself and assessing your needs. I say do this often. Do it in times of big emotions and also do it regularly throughout the day. Um, Kristen Neff, self-compassion. I'm a big, big, big fan. A uh, lot of self-compassion to touch. I personally like will put my hands over my heart and kind of close my eyes and ask myself like, what's going on? How are we right now in this moment? Any feelings, any physical sensations, any thoughts? What's gone on earlier in the day? What's about to come? What do I need? Do I need a break? Do I need a phone call? Do I need a meal? Do I need a stretch? Do I need to just be and keep on with the flow? But that actual act of pausing and checking in with yourself and assessing is giving you more openness to live in the adaptive place. Also finding fulfillment in the present. So we're doing this through mindfulness, which I encourage everyone to practice is how do I be open and non-judgmental in the present present moment and be able to find fulfillment in that and using your values to guide you. So I know I've harped on values a lot already and I will continue to do so because I think it is so, so, so important. Um, but using that kind of guiding light of your life Values are different than goals. Values are things that I can check off with a checkbox. Either I succeeded in this or I did not. Um, values are, here's how I want to live my life. So if I am have the value of being a hard worker, maybe a values-oriented goal would be, you know, getting a promotion next, you know, next year. So that's a goal based on my value of hard work. But even if I don't get that goal, I, and I still am showing up day to day at my job with the value of hard work, then there's still a lot of fulfillment that happens there and alignment to who you are and what feels worthy, which impacts your energy levels and yada, yada, yada. Two big questions to ask yourself, how are you striving? Why are you striving? So how you are striving is, am I hurting myself or others in this process? And I think, especially when I work with folks in the eating disorder realm, is they're not so sure if they're hurting themselves or they're certainly downplaying it. Um, no, I'm fine. This is totally workable. I've got this. I don't need any help. Um, so how you are striving, you have to get really honest with yourself. Am what I am, is what I'm doing workable? And if you aren't so sure, again, pulling in the people that know and love you best, asking them, this is what I'm doing. Is that, does that sound crazy? Is this workable? Um, so am I striving in a way that is workable and considers me as a whole person beyond just what I'm striving for? And then why are you striving? Am I striving because I think I'm not good enough and I have something to prove? We're probably living in a maladaptive place. We're probably setting ourselves up for a lot of anxiety and feeling like we're running on a treadmill towards success, going nowhere fast. Or am I striving because this is something really important to me? And I'm really curious to see if I gave it my all, what I could accomplish. I'm not totally sure, but it makes me excited to think about. Um, 
a lot of times with my athletes that I work with is I say, I work with swimmers and runners a lot. I'm like, if you never went a best time again, would you still swim? Would you still run? And it's really interesting to hear the people that are like, no, why would I be doing this if I would never do, if I would never get a best time? And I'm like, well, we got to like, we got to have some talk about your values or like the level of suffering you're experiencing for the sake of that one outcome that may or may not happen. We just don't know. Some people miss their goal time by 0.01 seconds. That's a lot of right of suffering and writing on your self-worth for that small, uncontrollable piece of that outcome of whether you do or you don't versus like, you know what, maybe I would, I would still swim because I like it. I like the opportunity. It'd be cool to see if I could get that Olympic trials cut, but I don't know. Um, so I really like that, that piece for reflection. A quick note, um, around perfectionism is perfectionism, at least in our society and especially with women believe that like balance exists, like, oh, I'll, I'll slow down or I'll take better care of myself when, um, you know, when this busy season is over or when this happens or when that happens, there's always something that takes its place we're never in a state of balance. <laughs> we are either constantly underwhelmed or overwhelmed or we're vacillating between the two. And that's okay. Like that's just the seasons of life and how things go. Um, but for women particularly, there is this, this notion of like women have to have it all together or to be balanced in order to kind of be well or healthy or looked fondly upon. Um, and so like when women don't have things in balance, that's when we kind of hear like, oh, well, she's a hot mess. There's not really a hot mess descriptor for men. And so like there's these different sociocultural underpinnings here about balance and perfectionism, especially as it relates to women, but also for perfectionism in general. And just know that if you are someone who is high achieving or perfectionistic in at least that one area of your life, perfectionism choose to lean towards feeling overwhelmed rather than underwhelmed. So just make sure that you're giving yourselves breaks because if you're kind of gravitating towards the overwhelm, we need periods of time where we're stabilized. And sometimes that feels when we're underwhelmed, like we feel bored, um, but don't confuse boredom with stability. So just a quick note on that. But let's go ahead and transition into the perfectionism application to sport, specifically with eating disorders and body image and in body image. So I um, I work in sports performance separate from eating disorder and body image. However, I um, I wanted to hone this part a little bit more towards eating disorders and body image. But perfectionism perfectionism in sport can go many ways, including performance anxiety, entering flow states, um, technique, competition, um, things like that. So I, there's a whole nother presentation probably for that. Um, but wanted to focus on the fitness and sport piece for athletes with eating disorders and the risk there. So the onset prevalence and risk of eating disorders we see in athletes between the ages of 13 and 14 years old and 17 to 18, 13 and 14 is usually because of puberty. So changes in the body that feel new and ambiguous and scary and trying to control that and 17 to 18, because that's when we usually see athletes trying to get whatever extra little edge they can to perform. So that would be like if if I'm trying to go run in college and I'm training as hard as I am, I'm doing everything right. Maybe if I just lost, maybe if I just lost three to five pounds, I'd try every little thing. So that's where a little bit of risk gets there. Um, also, athletes in general tend to be a little bit more at risk than non-athletes for eating disorders, especially if they're in lean sports. Um, so that would in the research quantifies lean sports as endurance, aesthetic, and weight class sports. Um, so that's just like the verbiage used in the research there. Um, women tend to be more influenced by leanness and thinness, while males tend to be more influenced by muscle mass. Sport is also a protective factor, though, just because you have... Um, just because you're in sport doesn't mean that you're going to get an eating disorder. 
So sport can be very protective. It instills factors of resilience, teamwork, strength, speed, coordination, self-esteem, healthy competition, um, identity development. There's so many good things that come from sport. So it can be a really actually strong protective factor. So sports do not equal eating disorders. There's a lot of also like biopsychosocial factors going on. So I just like to give that caveat when I'm talking about this. So this chart I talk about a lot in presentations and I felt like it was really important to have here as well. So this was a study done about the gray area between athletes or good athletes versus overlooked traits of a person with anorexia. We're going to go line by line here. So the good athlete would be demonstrating what is in the research called mental toughness. So this is self-control and the and the ability to play through the pain as an athlete. So kind of knowing that like I might not, I might show up to training knowing that I, you know, my parents are getting a divorce. How can I play through the emotional pain of knowing that that's going on at home, but still having goals as an athlete? Or sometimes it's like I'm coming to, I'm coming to practice or I'm coming to a competition and I'm sore from last week's training. I can still bring my all and push past the pain so that I can try to perform. Whereas someone with anorexia has a strong tendency to seek virtue through self-restraint. So kind of saying I am morally above or I feel better about myself because I'm restraining myself, because I'm not allowing myself to have certain desires or things that other people have. So there's a difference between that mental toughness of acknowledging the pain and like kind of being tough about it versus saying like, I'm fine and I'm better off if I just pretend that these things aren't happening. Or if I can say like, yeah, no, this soreness doesn't bother me. There's like a virtue aspect there. Commitment to training versus excessive exercise. So the training to excel in the commitment to training comes through periodization. So like fitness uh, coaches and um, sport coaches will know that periodization is what you're doing to train your athletes in ways that involve high intensity and and, and periods of recovery. And there needs to be both in order for kind of like the, the rest time or championship time to have more rest, to kind of let that, all that hard work come to fruition. Um, if we're always training at really high levels all the time with no rest, we're going to burn out and we're going to um, increase risk of injury and our performance isn't going to do as well versus excessive exercise. So that's the coming back to the word compulsive from the perfectionism, compulsive movement, feeling like I have to do these things um, to avoid any negative emotions or despite any negative consequences. Uh, I live in Jacksonville, Florida. Thankfully, I did not have any hurricane issues up here, but um, I did see a video of someone running during the hurricane. And I think they lived in the like Tampa, St. Pete area. So that would be like an excessive exercise. That would make me wonder about how that person is doing because it's not safe to be running in a hurricane. But that excessive compulsive movement is um, interesting of like, why, why can't that person take an off day or why can't they supplement an exercise that would be inside, but kind of like, why do I have to go and do this movement, even if it's not really fitting the context of the situation? Pursuit of excellence versus perfectionism. So here we are again. Um, pursuit of excellence is what I'm kind of saying as adaptive perfectionism. And then the perfectionism on the individual with an eating disorder side is more of that maladaptive perfectionism. So the pursuit of excellence is always raising the bar. They're excited. They're having healthy competition, that opportunity to feel like I can try my best and see what I can do versus the maladaptive perfectionism is never feeling good enough and really driven by fear. So we've kind of heard all of that in the regular perfectionism type world. But now as we bring it into the athletic and eating disorder side, this is where we're seeing that show up here. Coachability versus overcompliance. So the openness to teachers and respect for others. And there's usually a desire to please a coach when you're when you're an athlete, all of that within normal limits for coachability. Overcompliance is conforming beyond your values and because there's a need to please and is, again, driven by fear. 
So I'm, I'm really downplaying what I, what I value. Um, I'm putting my values aside for the sake of pleasing this person. Cause I'm so beyond myself that if I were to ever think of saying that this is against what I believe in or what I think I need for myself, that I would be displeasing that person. And I'd really rather not do that. Their, their needs are more important than mine, which kind of leads to the next one, unselfishness versus selflessness. So this is the unselfishness is being a team player. There's no lion team. I know when to pass the ball. I don't need to be selfish in sport versus selflessness is a total lack of responsiveness to our needs. Um, there's a little sense of self and there's a strong fear of displeasing others. I always think in my mind that this is like the, like I think of someone like shrinking into this like small person. This person sees themselves as this small insignificant person that doesn't need to acknowledge their own needs and that everyone else is more important than me. And the last one is performance despite pain versus denial of discomfort. So playing through the pain, similar to the mental toughness. I know that when I'm working out and people who, you know, different levels of their fitness, like there's times where you're in the middle of a, in the middle of a set and those last couple of reps feel really hard and you want to quit and you don't like that's playing through the pain versus denial of discomfort is like denying the existence of pain and pushing beyond what is safe. Um, so this might be like my, my back is really hurting and I've been known to have some back injuries and I'm still going to push through. That's denying of the discomfort. Um, and we're not being safe anymore at this point. And I did put <laughs> run DMC at the top of this slide because I just want to acknowledge that this is really, this is really tricky. <laughs> it's really difficult because it's really hard to tell like where the gray area is between. And like some people might make check marks on one side of their experience and one on the other side. And I think it takes a lot of knowing someone and checking in to determine where people are on the spectrum. Um, also like for the denial of discomfort, athletes generally have high pain tolerance and a strong ability to suffer. So like they're already making it more complicated by having those characteristics. Um, similarly with like the over-exercise and commitment to training, like these folks are athletes, like if you're talking to someone who is a Ironman and they train for Ironman triathlons versus someone who, you know, lifts three times a week at the gym for about an hour or, or so, like they have totally different training plans. So if you're used to just working with the weightlifter and you hear someone is like running, swimming, weightlifting, cycling all these hours a week, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, that's over exercise. And not exactly because it's like different depending on on the sport. So there's a lot of nuance here. And I, I empathize with with people in that. Um, and it just takes continued conversation, supports and checking in. Some of the negative consequences in um, eating disorder in sport is relative energy deficiency in sport. So this was um, originally came from the female athlete triad, which shows that there's a lack of energy on board for movement, um, which is decreasing their menstrual function and putting their bone health at risk. Men can still have energy deficiency, but it's more often related to low testosterone. And there's different treatment considerations of when someone is fully, you know, there's enough energy on board, all systems are go, we're good to go with movement. Um, yellow is kind of like moderation. And then red is like, there's a high risk here, we have to stop physical activity. Um, and I think I use a lot of like joy in sport when you're working with appropriate training plans is like, how do I find joy in what I'm doing, rather than that compulsive piece like we were talking about before with the maladaptive when someone's in a relative energy deficiency, sometimes they have accidentally slipped into this place. They don't know their nourishment needs or other times they're coming at it from a maladaptive perfectionistic lens of like, this is the way I need to control my nutrition so I can control my body so that I can control my sport outcomes. Maladaptive versus adaptive. There's also plenty of mental health um, challenges with, um, relative energy deficiency and eating disorder in sport and fitness. I skipped over that, um, but I wanted to highlight some of the performance detriments and talk about that this is what is happening when we're struggling with disordered eating or we're in that maladaptive mindset in sport as it relates to nutrition in sport. Um, there's actually paradoxical effects, like you're not gonna have as much strength, you're gonna be at more increased risk of injury, you're not gonna have as much endurance. Um, and I've worked with some athletes and they're like, well, when I first started to lose weight in my sport, when I was really, really, you know, controlling my food intake, I started 
playing a lot better. I started feeling a lot stronger and a lot lighter. And I'm like, yes, the research does show that some fat loss in sport will help to a certain point. And so that's why I put the bell curve there. And so it's really hard when someone's like, yes, I've seen this improvement in my performance, when then there's always this part of diminishing returns. And it's really difficult because how can you tell someone who is saying, I have all these really great outcomes that have happened for me that I'm saying there's no, this isn't happening anymore, but they're like, but it was, and I'm like, yes, it was, but it no longer is. So it is this really kind of challenging place of acknowledging that there could be some benefit, but in the long term, it's definitely not going to be beneficial. And there's a lot more risk of physical, mental, and emotional health here too. So what I usually have people focus on is the other 39 factors of sport performance. So Weight is one factor of sport performance. However, there's 39 others. And so when I have someone in a maladaptive mindset who is really nitpicking their weight and trying to be as perfectionistic as possible for weight, um, I say, well, look at all these other things. What on here also aligns with a value? And it's like, well, I guess coachability or um, having heart in sport. Okay. How can we focus on that from an adaptive mindset? How can we make that a value? And then let's see how if we use our brain space to look at some of these other factors rather than just zoning in on weight, we're going to see that there's going to be a higher likelihood of sport performance. Um, yeah, so this is a great way that I try to switch into that adaptive place. Some other things to how to have adaptive perfectionism in sport and in movement. So number one, I said it again, I'm going to say it again, is remember that you are worthy as you are. Worth is inherent. There is no, there's also no winning in societal expectations. Um, they're changing all the time. We feel constantly like we're trying to keep up with them. So can we accept that there's just no winning when it comes to what our society deems as worthy in terms of looks or performance um, and acknowledge that there's this human suffering of the societal ideals and just accepting that this is the world, world we live in. And that's not to say that there are plenty of people out there that are still going to potentially treat certain people differently based on maybe how attached they are to societal expectations. Um, I would hope that the people who are dealing with any kind of like marginalized hate or discrimination there, get all the support that they need. And I hear you and I see you that this is not, it's a lot easier said than done. Um, but really coming back to like, I am worthy as I am, that person's treatment of me is more indicative of where they are stuck in their own process um, and how I can use my perfectionism as my superpower, despite maybe the, the hand that I'm dealt or like the way people are treating me. Self-reflection. So we've talked a lot about this already, but mindful awareness, being able to be open, non-judgmentally aware of what's going on, on my internal experiences. So my thoughts, my feelings, and my behaviors, and then what's going on on the outside. What's going on? What, what day of the week is it? What time of day is it? Have I had enough to eat? Am I connected in my social relationships? Is it rainy? Is it cold? These are all things that affect me. <laughs> So we, when we're a little bit more open and mindful of what's going on and we can note that, then that helps us then form our needs assessment of, okay, based on the context of this situation and what's going on with me personally, what do I need today? And am I able to communicate some of that with my coach, with a teammate? Is there ways that I can modify what is going on today to best fit my needs? Values, we've talked a lot about that too. Use values versus goals, especially when our thinking brain gets really trapped up in that I have to achieve these goals. How can I be more values-based to be more adaptive in my perfectionism? And then the hurting versus helping. So again, why am I striving? How am I striving? Am I striving in a way that's hurting myself or helping myself? And then I think a large part of it is identity. Our identity goes beyond fitness and sport and competition. It's a lifestyle and a value system. We get so many good things from sport um, in terms of like being, being ambitious, having resiliency, having drive. Um, and I think so much about this quote that I saw from a sports psychology book a while ago is sport is so, 
amazing because it gives us the ability to care so passionately about something that doesn't truly matter. Nobody on their deathbed says, well, I wish I would have worked harder in that workout. (laughs) No, they talk about the relationships and the experiences that they've had. Um, So how can I expand my identity to be about a lot of things? And I can bring the sport values with me. Um, but I can be brave. I can be a team player. I can have a desire to always grow in life. And that leads me to a more adaptive and flexible mindset versus the mindset of being fearful, being like, feeling like I I have to have a certain type of identity or I have to have a stereotypical identity to feel worthy. And then the last point there that hopefully I've sprinkled in throughout, but I truly believe in looping and trusted supports. Um, So having um, friends, families, coaches, teammates, fitness professionals, people in your lives that you feel like you can just open up and talk about it, therapists, dietitians, people who are on your team. All right, we are at the end. So these are some sources. I'm also happy to, to chat about other things later. Um, and just a big thank you to everyone who came to listen today. Um, if you enjoyed the presentation, um, if you would feel so kind to leave me a Google review on my page, this just helps folks who are trying to improve their relationship with perfectionism and eating disorder and sport find me if they want therapeutic support. Um, I also have my email address up there and my website and my Instagram. So I'm always happy to talk more about these topics with other professionals or if someone is seeing this and feeling like, hey, I really feel like I want to learn how to tap into the adaptive perfectionistic mindset. Um, I'm happy to do free consultation calls and help with anyone who might be looking for that support from a psychological perspective. But this was so awesome. Thank you so, so much for presenting. We appreciate you tons. And I learned a ton and really reflected a ton. So this was awesome. (laughs) Thanks, Abby. Yeah, I I love this topic. And I'm like you said, always happy to talk more about it. So if people want to want to reach out, please do. I'm happy to. Perfect. Yay. Well, thank you all for tuning in. And thank you for being here. And I will see y'all again soon. Yay. Bye. Bye.